and double check that your resort fee is included in your rate if you're staying here at the hotel. The public talk is tonight, and you can see some of the notes here. There's a cash bar. Session scribes, for everybody that's um, been leading sessions during the week, you'll see um, a link here to a Google Doc, and please provide a summary of um, the accomplishments and what went on during your talk, your breakout session. Those, uh, those slides will be used for tomorrow's plenary. <clears throat> there are more t-shirts that are coming today and the surveys are open and there are links there. Save the date, the next LSST community meeting in Europe is coming up. And we have received some feedback already for where will you be for the eclipse? And you can start to see the line forming along there. So thank you to everybody that's provided input. And somebody's gonna get a nice vignetted look from Cancun, it looks like, so. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go over what the content of today's plenary will be. It's a little bit different format. It's going to start with three short talks that describe um, why verification and validation matter, what commissioning means to us. And then Beth will talk briefly on commissioning data rights. And then we're gonna have a little bit of an experiment. Um, to my knowledge, this hasn't been done at, at one of the previous all hands before, but we're gonna have a panel session. And um, you'll see that there are six panelists listed there and we'll have a moderator, Chuck Claver. And they're gonna come up here, the second half of the plenary, and, we're going to, and they're gonna talk about their own experiences and lessons learned from past commissioning and operational efforts. So um, we're gonna give each of them an opportunity to talk and then we're gonna open it up for interaction and dialogue with, with the rest of the audience as well. So that should be exciting. All right, so diving right in. So the first talk is one that I'll be giving. My name is Brian Selvey. I'm the systems engineering manager. And I'm going to talk about really why ver verification and validation matter. If you've been to some of these plenaries in the past, past years, we've had topics on this, but they've been more process oriented. I'm not going to bore you with process. I guarantee you, you won't see um, the systems engineering V more than once in this presentation. So, um, but really, this is really what what's the value of doing of of doing this? What could be considered extra work? And it's not extra work, but I want to try to describe to you um, really why this matters and what we get out of doing this. <clears throat> so, really, why does this matter? Why why are we going through this process of of coming up with formal verification and validation plans. Many of you have probably had me come and bug you um, for input for these plans. And you might wonder why, well, why are we going through this rigorous process? Why do I have to write all this down? What's, what's, what's the point? What do we get out of this? Is it just, this is just paperwork, you know? We're all smart people, we know what to do. Why don't we just, um, just go forward? Well, um, there are some, contributing factors that we should look at as to why we do need some rigor. And we could start here with the definition, one definition of a system, which was put forth by a systems thinker named Donella Meadows. And she describes a system as an interconnected set of elements that are that's coherently organized in a way to achieve something. And <clears throat> really the thing to think about here is that it's that something. Every system achieves something. Um, and that's why they become stable after they're, they're, um, they're built and commissioned and, and go into operations. And that's why they're difficult to change at that point, right? Um, once, once something achieves stability, it's very hard to change. The problem is, though, that many times that something's not always what we wanted it to do, right? And so that's really, that's really what we're talking about here, is we want to align that something that we all think that we need, the stakeholders believe we need, with the as-delivered something. Another reason why this is important is complexity grows very quickly. So most of you are probably familiar with a little bit of graph, th graph theory um, with nodes and edges, and we can very easily extract this and start talking about how this applies to us um, with components and interfaces, right? So um, it starts to compound very quickly. You'll see here with two nodes, you can get one um, theoretical edge or interface, and then it continues to go up at four, you get six. And it starts to balloon very, very quickly. <clears throat> Once you get the 12, 66 theoretical interfaces, when you get up to 100, you've got almost 5,000 theoretical interfaces. 
And as you can see on the left, you know, these are theoretical upper limits, right? And in, in, in reality, if we're talking about either a social system or, or an engineered system, you get really more of that hub and spoke network that you looked at, that you see in the bottom left. Um, so this is again, a, an upper limit. Um, but the, the point is, is that this does still, still compound and, and it, it still gets very complicated. If we look at LSST, it's really hard to even evaluate and come up with some good metric about um, the number of interactions or interfaces on this project. But one corollary that we can use is our work breakdown structure because it's a product and service oriented break, work breakdown structure. So it gives us a sense of the products and services that LSST is, is being built to deliver. And if you look across both the NSF and the, and the um, DOE portions of the WBS, there are 599 nodes. And that, you'll see, gives us almost 180,000 possible interactions. And again, I'll be the first to contend that you know, these aren't technical product edges, right? But this would be closer to the possible number of social interactions that are, are feasible on this project. That means you know, all the interactions that we're having at meetings like this, all the point-to-point -point connections that each of you have in your conversations in your, in your daily in your daily work, and all those actually matter. We are part of this system. We are part of this environment, um, and the interactions that we have do matter. Those interactions um, contribute to the technical definition of, of LSST. So again, this is a theoretical upper limit, but it does give you some sense of how complicated LSST is. If we just start to look at from a technical perspective, these graphs were put together by Catherine Weston, one of our um, systems engineers, and she's gone through and she's mined the requirements that we're tracking just at the project level. And you'll see that even just at the project level, there are over 3,000 verification events that we're tracking right now. And that, <clears throat> that's a combination of specification requirements and interface requirements. And that's just at the project level. At the subsystem level, this thing will tree out very quickly. If you start to think about the, then the number of requirements and interfaces at the subsystems, that compounds probably by another factor of 10. And then in many cases, we have vendors that are actually building a lot of our hardware and software for us. And we have vendor specifications in interface control documents as well. And then that's another compound, compounding factor. So the main point here is that really the complexity is, is almost overwhelming. And if we don't have some formal processes and ways to manage it, it can get out of control and things can fall through the cracks. So I hope you all can understand that LSST is a complex system, but how do we manage that complexity? So one way is this model that was put forth by David Snowden and Mary Boone, and um, it's called this Kinevin model. That's, that's actually the right spelling. It's pronounced Kinevin. It's a Welsh word. Um, but they contend that there are different categories of systems going from simple to complicated to complex to chaotic, and their contention is that the ways that you approach and handle a system in one of these domains do not apply in another domain. So we have to be very conscious of what domain we are in and apply tools and processes applicable to that domain. And what a lot of us do with linear thinking, right, is what applies in the simple domain. It's the sense categorized response, the best practice. It's the I see an effect and based on um, known past experiences, I can very, with high uh, fidelity, guess what the causes are or deduce the causes. When we get to complicated, these are, this is where typical engineered systems reside where there are many, many feedback loops and linear cause effect thinking um, in its simplest form doesn't apply anymore. Because there are so many feedback loops, we have to think about things in a different way. We have to be able to model and understand what those feedback loops do to system um, performance. And then in complex, that's, that's even another domain where there's emergent behavior, which says that the sum is, is great, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, that as you start to integrate a system, you observe behavior that you couldn't deduce by just looking at the component behavior. Another area where, complex, where the complexity domain applies is with autonomous agents. And that's a, a fancy word just for talking about, you know, in one case, people, right? 
with all these people in this room and we start to interact, we can't model how we're all, the, the, the outcomes a priori um, to all of these interactions beforehand. So the way that we approach a problem needs to be consistent with the domain that we're in. And I would contend that LSST is firmly on the, on the um, continuum between complex and complicated. There are a lot of our systems that we can use first principles um, and, and physical models, physics-based models to analyze that would be firmly in the complicated domain where we can come up with a model and we have very high, um, we have very high confidence that the results will be, um, will be backed up by, uh, by test data, right, by empirical data. There are systems on LSST that are firmly in the complex domain, and one example would be the camera cryo refrigeration system. This you can't analyze the first principles. The um, I'm not an expert in this, but the 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 constituent gases for this are it's a blend of 12 different constituent gases. I I believe that's the right number, and you can't deduce. Um, the, the thermodynamic principles to, to great fidelity because the system um, is so complex. So you have to use different approaches to deal with that. And then again, if we start to put the people in the system, which we are, we are part of the system, we're firmly in the complex domain. We can't, we can't analyze how uh, the, the interactions are going to affect the system with, with great confidence. So, so what do we do? Well, that's really why we need some systems engineering rigor. If we're in the complex domain, there are tools and processes that have been proven to work. There are things like design of experiment, agile systems engineering, agile software engineering. Those apply in the complex domain. In the complicated, here's your one opportunity to see the systems engineering be. Um, typical um, tr traditional systems engineering practices are very good at dealing with, with complicated problems where you analyze and, and um, deduce what the system should be down to components and unit parts, and then integrate back up on the right-hand side of the V. And as you're integrating, you verify at each um, intermediate step. And again, if there's you know, other approaches too that we can talk, take about, talk about, and one is as, as if we verify as early and the lowest levels of possible at basically the bottom right-hand side of the V, it's we're pushing down in many cases from the complicated to the simple or from the complex to the complicated domains where we can get better, better knowledge about how components interact and work. So there are reasons why we would wanna um, produce uh, or, or at least apply some VNB rigor here. So that all sounds good, but it probably sounds like a lot of work, but what happens if we don't manage this complexity? Well, this is a chart from the Professional Society for Systems Engineers called INCOSI. And um, this shows that the bar graphs on the bottom um, show the amount of typical project budget that is expended in each of the, the, the phases of a project. So in the concept phase, on average, 8% of your overall budget is, is expended. But at the end of the concept phase, you've committed 70% of your cost based, uh, based on the decisions you've already made. Right and design, it goes to 15% um, of your budget has been expended, but you've committed 85%. And you'll see that the cost to extract defects goes up fairly, exp you know, for, fairly quickly. Um, and it's better to catch defects early, right? And so this just goes again to the concept of ver planning early, ver uh, having verification plans to verify things at an early component level does matter. If we wait too late and we find them too late, um, our options to deal with these issues greatly get reduced. We may have to live with defects. Um, we may have to come up with operational procedures to work around um, behavior that we, that we don't want. Here's another example. My, my background is in aerospace, so, <clears throat> so when I talk about experiences, my, my experiences are more from aerospace. But, um, I think this is really still a very applicable example. This is a, a graph um, that a, the Quality Assurance Organization at NASA put together for the, 
for the space shuttle program. And the y-axis is, um, uh, is, is a mirrored image, um, and the scale of, uh, of the bars on the y-axis um, are a measure of the rigor of the requirements verification and quality assurance oversight as applied over time on the shuttle program. And you'll see an unfortunate repeating pattern. Um, as complacency grows over time, um, you'll see that si safety becomes silent. There were huge disasters. Then there's a disaster that occurs, oversight goes up, the problems go away, and over time complacency takes over again and another disaster. Um, and that's, you know, it's a pattern that's obvious, um, but we don't seem to learn from. And I, I'll, I'll end with one very personal example from my past. Um, early in my career, as some of you know, I worked at SpaceX. And this was before I was a systems engineer. I was a launch operations engineer working on their first vehicle, the Falcon 1. And as proof, you'll see that um, there's, a, there's an article from the Kwajalein Hourglass there on the left. That's the weekly newspaper from Kwajalein Island and the Marshall Islands where um, the Falcon 1 was launched from. And um, I was right around employee 100 there. This is a very small team. And uh, we spent tens of thousands of hours, man hours, developing and testing the Falcon 1. Um, tens of thousands of parts were designed, integrated, and tested. Hundreds of thousands of lines of software code were written and tested. And as we got closer to the launch, <clears throat> many of us that were involved in launch ops were putting in seven, seven day work weeks and got up to working 18 hours a day to, to prepare for this launch. Um, what I'm gonna show you next is a series of still images that will show you what happened during the, the launch phase, the takeoff of this vehicle. So this was the very first launch on March 26, 2006. And pay attention and see if you see anything that kind of doesn't look ordinary. Anything not look right? So 68 seconds later, from a different vantage point, there was an explosion off the coast of Omelec. Um, the rocket was lost. I was part of the um, launch operations recovery team. I was on the first boat that had to go back to the small island of Omelec and have to start cataloging the pieces and, and um, and collecting the debris. And we walked into a little machine shop on the island, and you'll see there, we saw, we found the satellite. That was a student satellite built by students at the Air Force Academy, and um, all their hard work was lost as well. So after this happened, there was obviously a very large root cause analysis um, failure investigation that went on. And, um, it's almost embarrassing to say what brought down this rocket. Um, the root cause analysis was traced back to a single quarter inch flared fitting on uh, the pneumatic system on the first stage of this rocket. That one, that one part that failed brought down this rocket. Um, that, that, that fitting was used on this pneumatic line that fed um, compressed nitrogen to a, a solenoid actuator that held open the, the first stage main fuel valve. Um, this part corroded. This part was not properly lock wired, so it wasn't properly verified. It backed off from the vibrations of the launch. Um, that, that valve started to fail. It started to lose pressure. It started to close. The, mix, the fuel oxidizer mixture ratio got off cause that fire that you saw. So um, when you think about it, you know, now looking back in hindsight, right, it's obvious. Now, now I've gone through formal systems engineering training and I see the value. SpaceX didn't have systems engineers back then. In fact, I don't know if they even do today. Um, there weren't requirements. There was just people designing based on best practices. So aluminum was chosen for that part because it was lighter weight. 
Um, this launch vehicle was designed to launch from its, a different part of the, the globe. This, this launch vehicle is supposed to launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. But because of political, political reasons, um, they had to move. They moved to the Marshall Islands, which is in a completely different environment, um, very salt corrosive atmosphere, humidity that's typically at almost 100% all the time and temperatures that are typically well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So this, this, the, the, the materials were picked on assumptions that were no longer applicable. The environmental requirements changed and because there were no requirements written down, um, because there was none of that rigor, nobody thought to go check this stuff. So you could say that, you know, all right, great, that's aerospace, that doesn't apply here. LSST is not going to blow up when we turn it on. Okay. I hope not. Um, but the passion and commitment to succeeding that I had when I was at SpaceX, I'd contend that I, I at least believe all of you probably feel as well. To LSST. You have that same passion and commitment and want LSST to be successful. Um, we've got to deliver on what we've promised, right? If we don't deliver an observatory that meets the science community's expectations, um, I'm going to feel personal, um, like there's, there's failure, and I suspect you will too. You know, this isn't just about delivering hardware, it's, it's our own integrity and reputations on the line as well. So, um, We've, well, we, you know, SpaceX has, has one advantage going for them. They can just go build another rocket, right? And they did. We're not going to go build another LSST. So we, we really have to deliver and finish LSST on schedule and budget and deliver a quality product. Um, I'm pretty sure the NSF is not going to go back and give us more money if we, if we don't deliver what we said we were. So, um, like I said, this was, this was before I was a formal systems engineer. And um, events, personal events like this really did make me realize that there is value in doing some of that upfront planning. Doing some of that upfront planning um, really can avoid uh, big problems down the road. And so what that really made me realize is that the details do matter and planning matters. So if we go back and we look at that quote from Donella Meadows again on the definition of a system, um, Really, that's when I talked about that something again. That's really what systems engineers are trying to do. We're trying to align the as designed, as built something with the desired something. And having some rigor and the right amount of rigor, the tailored amount of rigor um, in verification and validation can help us align those. Thank you. So next, um, so we, we have three presentations. The next one is going to be by Chuck Claver on what commissioning means. Very good. Thank you, Brian. That was great. Um, it's actually kind of very eye-opening and, and a little bit sobering. Um, and so with that, with that as a backdrop, um, I'm going to keep my presentation relatively short today. Um, and um, some of you that were in the, the Monday breakout will have already heard this. But um, throughout the week here, um, since the Monday breakout, I've been hearing a lot of conversation about um, you know, commissioning um, and verification validation. It's kind of been sort of an under underwriting theme uh, this whole week throughout all of our conversations and whatnot. And the reason for that is, is that, um, as you saw in Victor's presentation and many other presentations uh, throughout the week, that um, things are coming together and it's pretty darned exciting. Um, and hardware, hardware is being delivered, software is, is uh, being written, um, you know, data are being analyzed uh, uh, across the board. And um, I, I came to realize this, this week, listening to people talk, that um, 
on this project, commissioning. We use the word commissioning rather loosely and broadly, and it means many different things to many different people. Um, for example, uh, commissioning, uh, in one sense, uh, is a work breakdown structure. It's a it's a, one of our WBS elements. And uh, to someone else, um, commissioning means this last very final stage of of uh, understanding and putting the, this thing together and making it work. Um, and to me, it means something very different. Um, uh, and so what I thought I'd do is kind of re, I thought I'd take this opportunity to spend maybe about 10 minutes here and reiterate what I think our project definition, how I, we as a project view what commissioning is. And as, Again, for those that were in the breakout on Monday, I, I, I apologize that this is a bit repetitious, but I think it um, it bears repeating because I think it will help us going forward. Um, and at the end of uh, Brian's um, uh, presentation, the very last bullet there is says planning matters. Um, I don't know. There's a very I don't know if you, you're familiar with it, but there's a very famous quote by a former president of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower. And the quote goes something like this, this won't be perfect, but it goes something like this, that going into battle, your battle plan is worthless, but the planning was essential, right? So as we go forward and we start working out our verification plans, validation plans, and our commissioning plans, those plans are not gonna go exactly as we think they're gonna go, but the actual act of doing it gets us thinking about what Steve Kahn, our director, um, has been referring to recently as, as the end game, right? We're starting, we're, we're in that very early transitionary period where we're going from thinking about build, build, builds, figure out requirements, 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 to here's the thing, put it together, make it work. Eventually, we have to deliver a completed functioning LSST as an observatory system. So we're entering into that end game. And these plans are important for us. So as we go forward and we think about uh, commissioning, as I think about commissioning, I think commissioning answers three basic questions. Right, so first question is, did we build the thing that we said we're going to build? That's verification, right? So, and that's already started, right? That's happening now at the subsystem level, at the component level. We've got lenses being uh, on the verge of being uh, verified and accepted. We've, we've got um, telescope mounts that are uh, in the starting their own verification processes uh, and test procedures to, to, to uh, with the vendor to say that, yep, we built the, the thing that we asked for and what, what we wanted, wanted to, uh, what we said we were going to do. Um, and the same with the software. The software is, you know, the, our, our data processing software is, is continuously being verified through their continuous build process. Um, but then as, we, as the, the, the system gets built up and, and the pieces get more and more complicated, we need to start asking the, the second question. Did we build the right thing? Does, does it do what we want and expect it to do? And that's validation. And that too starts at the very lowest level, right? Um, and we build that up as we go, um, uh, as the, the pieces come together and get more and more, more uh, complicated. And we go, you know, I, I really like Brian's chart that showed in, uh, you go from sort of a complex system that you can't necessarily predict it, how it's gonna behave, but, you, but, but, but ultimately we're gonna have to understand that. And then, you know, that, that's the whole process of, of going up down the V and back up the, the V. You go from a concept or a thought or a system that's very complicated, you try to push it down to something simple that you can then engineer, but then as you walk back up the, the V, you have, to, you have to do this verification validation. So you verify the simple things, the things you can, you validate it as it gets more complicated, and then you have to, at, at the end, the last question, do we understand how and why the thing we built uh, works the way it does. And that's characterization, right? Because some of the, at the end game, at the final stages of the LSST coming together, we can't necessarily predict exactly how it's gonna work, 
but we need to know that, right? In order to do the science, we need to know how it works. So those are my guiding principles going forward uh, as far as um, uh, pulling together everybody on, in this, this room to uh, make this thing happen is that as we go forward from, from here forward, I, I'm asking you to keep these three questions in the back of your mind as you do your work. And then in, as a project, um, we use the word commissioning to mean a very, it's, it's kind of an umbrella word, right? It, 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 it's not commissioning in the strictest sense of, of many other uh, uh, smaller projects. Um, we, we use, as I said at the beginning, a very broad definition. So it, for us in LSST, commissioning includes this final stage of integrating the camera, the telescope, the data management system, the, the EPO uh, system. So it, it, when we say commissioning on this project, we also mean system integration and test at the, the final stages of that with these big pieces coming together. It includes systems level verification. So at the high level, at the telescope camera data management and EPO level, we, we want to ask ourselves, did we, did we actually build what we said we we're going to build? It also includes validation of the science pipelines or in the science products. So this is, this is how we answer, did we build the, the right thing? Are we getting out of it what we expected to get out of it? It includes characterizing the, the system as it is being built, right? Because as Brian was saying, the, I, I agree with Brian 100% that this LSST is, is a complex system. And to understand some of that emergent behavior that we're going to get at the end of the day, we need to do a little bit of early work to understand how the, uh, the individual pieces um, uh, behave themselves. Because some of the individual pieces um, are complex in of themselves, not just the whole LSST, but you know, the telescope is a complex thing. The camera is a complex thing. The whole data management software suite is a complex thing. And you can't always predict exactly how um, it's going to work um, until you actually use it. And then lastly, we have to um, uh, understand the final product. How does LSST, as a complete observatory system, uh, behave and work. And I will conclude my short presentation with just a, uh, a reminder of some, some interesting dates that are in our future. And in particular, um, the first date up there is um, not all that far away. It's a little over a year away. And that's when real pixels are expected to start coming from our mountaintop from the auxiliary telescope. And um, you know, that's when we start do. That's that's when the end game really is in our face, right? Is 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 uh, starting a, a a little over a year for now. But um, th I hope that that you can understand that when I when, with trying to understand and verify and validate and characterize this complicated machine that we're building, that commissioning isn't something that's some far away. Uh, mile post three years down the road. Um, it is really starting now, and it has started, right? It has started with all of you at the verification level when you're verifying your piece of the puzzle. Um, and so, you know, we need to think, we need to think going forward that this whole uh, integration test commissioning is a, one giant continuum. It's not you know, my piece and I toss it over the wall and another person gets their piece, they toss it over the wall. It comes, we, we, it's just this, we're, we're now into this flow of, of all these parts coming together. And so, you know, you will hear from Brian and I and others when we come around and poking and prodding and we're just, we're trying to build up that understanding. So bear with us, but I think it's an investment worth in, uh, investing in. And I'll stop there and, now I think it's uh, time for me to turn it over to Beth to say a, a word or two. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this okay where it is on my shirt? I've got a little bit. Okay. Uh, great. So uh, Brian and Chuck, thank you, Ian. There's a 
Uh, great, thank you. Thank you for those excellent talks. I just have a couple of slides here um, to, to talk a little bit about a question that's been one of great interest on both the project and the community side of house, and that's commissioning data and what's going to have happen with the data and who may have access to it. Now, as Chuck nicely described, commissioning activities are starting now, even though we're a few years away from any uh, data flowing uh, into the LSST system. And so even though we're still a few years away from the actual uh, flow of data, the question of uh, what is the data access or the data rights policy for commissioning is of great interest now for a few reasons. One, you know, of course, the science community wants to know when can I get my hands on LSST data? How can I plan to best prepare for LSST data? When am I going to be able to fold in some real life observations into uh, my, my planning and preparation process. And then on the project side of the house, we're looking at getting ready for operations and planning for what sort of activities will take place during a four-year pre-operations ramp up to the 10-year survey between fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 22. And so it can be of great advantage to the pre-operations team to use uh, the vetting, the analysis, and the distribution of at least some of the commissioning data as a way to really prepare the team to be ready for effective and efficient operations on day one, and also to get early feedback, to ingest and react to early feedback from the community on uh, the LSST data itself to strengthen our readiness for the start of full operations. So there's a lot of possible advantages both on the LSST side of the house and in the community to figuring out how we can do some early distribution of data before the start of full operations. And so with those sorts of uh, interests in mind, we've had a number of conversations over the last year with both community members, the project science team, folks within the project, folks who are gonna be responsible for commissioning, our managing organizations, and representatives from the agencies to think about what uh, might an appropriate policy be to communicate at this stage in the game? Because with so many years away, there's a lot of things we don't quite know yet, uh, what resources will be available, what will be the most effective way to distribute data at the time. And so we're doing our, our best to have written a policy that'll clarify expectations and boundary conditions while deferring specifics for a couple of years when we flesh things out more. And so that's what these uh, few slides are intended to communicate. So uh, one of the balances uh, that we wanted to make is you know, thinking about the benefit of the early signs and early preparation with the need of the commissioning team to really focus on commissioning and getting ready for the operations readiness review, and also the balance between uh, giving super users, throwing them data over the wall as soon as possible, but staying true to the LSST ethos of all data rights uh, holders having an equal opportunity to access the data at the same time. And again, because a big part of the benefit for both the project and community of this uh, potential early data distribution is getting the feedback and reacting to community feedback, we want to be sure that we have the structures and the staffing to, again, ingest and react to that feedback uh, if we're going to go ahead and, and release any data. So, uh, so in this interest, we would like to release data from each of the three stages of commissioning after that stage of commissioning is over, and then with a few month buffer held to, again, do this preparation, to do the data vetting, and to get the necessary processes in place. So um, assuming the milestone schedule that Chuck just showed on his last slide, one could imagine a straw man schedule on which a pre-operations team could on a best effort basis disseminate some of the commissioning data. And uh, you know, I highlight these as sort of um, you know, by half year fidelity, imagining potentially the first part of uh, 2021 would be a time with that uh, schedule as presented. ComCam data could be distributed much later that year, close to the end of the year for full camera data. And then relatively earlier in 2022 could be a time that many surveys data would be distributed. And to put that in some perspective, we're currently planning right, to have two data releases based on the first year of full survey operations, with after the first six months of data are acquired, there will be a six months or so period to, uh, to process and distribute those data in a formal data release during operations. 
And the schedule for that is expected to be late calendar year 2023, which is early fiscal year 2024. And you know, instead of answering right now exactly which uh, data products will be released when and, who, and how that is all going to look, uh, the plan is for an early instantiation of the data release board, which will be the cross operations team board that will be involved with all of the steps uh, involved with producing the formal annual data releases, to have an early instantiation of that board start to exercise uh, their practices to develop um, the criteria for which products will be released, which images will be released, and close consultation with the science advisory committee. Uh, and those conversations will start at the beginning of commissioning operations. Um, the, the data management team and the emerging data facility are working towards the start of full operations to have the full capacity at the data archive and access center and have the full functionality ready to serve out to thousands of users uh, for the science platform. And so uh, we'll be cautious and careful as we uh, distribute these data during commissioning. And well, I want to say now that the minimum products that would be distributed would be flat files, you know, fits files and tables. And then again, several years from now, we'll have a better sense of what the appropriate distribution channel will be like. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that as much as we can on the best effort basis, the pre-operations team will want to get the community exposure to and experience with the actual user interfaces that the late 2023 first data release will be delivered through. Uh, and that's all I've got. So Brian, you're the boss. What do we do now? Questions for everyone or go to the panel? And so now, Brian will welcome <laughs> our panel speakers to the front. So as uh, Brian said, this is a little bit of an experiment. Um, we'll see how this goes. Um, so we've asked uh, six people from the project that have various kinds of experience uh, working on other telescopes, instruments, data systems, spacecraft uh, to come up. And um, we asked them to think about their experiences and um, how, uh, what lessons could we learn as we go move forward into this end game? Uh, what advice or just, just some anecdotes about what they experienced that we can learn from. And I, I'm going to start very quickly uh, and try not to take occupy too much time here. But so when I first came to NOAO, so I came at, uh, to Tucson right out of grad school. I came to NOAO as a staff scientist. Uh, the WIN 3.5 meter telescope on Kitt Peak was being commissioned at the time. And I was asked to um, uh, participate in that commissioning effort and examine um, the image quality performance of the telescope. So one of the things I did is I put a high-speed camera on that telescope, and it ran at uh, 200 frames per second. And I wanted to char characterize what the image motion uh, looked like. And to my shock, um, I saw that there was something like a, a 0.2 to 0.3 arc second peak-to-peak uh, -peak, uh, 23 hertz vibration uh, wiggling the image around back and forth. And long story short, it's, it's, uh, we had no clue as to why that was happening. And it took us four months to trace it down. I was at my wit's end. And at one point, I was sitting in the dome with my laptop with a battery-powered accelerometer on the telescope and pulled the mains on the observatory. No power whatsoever, zero, except for my battery and my laptop. The vibration was still there. That did not make sense. And it turned out that the secondary mirror on that telescope uh, there was four points that attached it. And so not to be over constrained kinematically, only three points were used. And it turned out that this vibration was the secondary mirror rocking back and forth um, across the diagonal of the, the three points. And uh, I just scratched it on a piece of paper that it, it happened to be that the uh, sound travel time across the diameter of the dome was about the equivalent of 23 hertz, one over 23 seconds. And so the, the bad news is that it was just being acoustically driven. And the good news is that the, that meant that the Q of the oscillation was incredibly high, which means you could easily damp it. So we put a dash pot on the fourth leg, and it went away. And so the, 
the lessons there, right, is for me is, and this is why you hear my hear me preaching to this all the time, is, you know, it took us four months to get there. And um, we could, I, th I think we could have avoided that by being a little bit more systematic in, in characterizing the behavior of this complicated machine uh, uh, as we went to uh, uh, anticipate this emergent behavior. So what I'm gonna ask the uh, panelists to do now is, um, so that's my anecdote, is to introduce themselves, uh, maybe a, a sentence or two about their background, and then uh, provide your anecdote. So how are we on time, Brian? What's, what's our time? 40 minutes, okay, so let's see, try to keep it to around five minutes or so, so we can uh, each, so we can um, uh, have some time for questions. So I'm gonna start off with Francisco Delgado. Uh, Good morning, Francisco Delgado. I'm the software manager for the Tensorflow side team, and I have previous experience in a couple of observatories. One that is relevant for the commissioning is the VLT. I was uh, participating as a software developer for the commissioning section of the plan, and between years 99 and 2002. So I was part of the commissioning team for UT2, UT3, and UT4. We had the luxury of that close of the telescope, so we can experiment in one without breaking the next one. Uh, one particular anecdote, which was a, a, a software problem that was really hard to find, but those problems that they are really easy to fix, as you can find it. It's, uh, I was in charge of the active optics system, and during the, all the commissioning and testing images for the image analyzer software in local VS work based with people. Um, we had this all the time away from sensitive working uh, in close loop. And after several months we discovered that some the residual RMS of the images were to the roof, everything crazy and it was rarely happening like once a week or something before just a minute. So it's, it was very hard to reproduce. So I developed a system for gathering all the data from the telemetry past. We, we didn't have an engineering facility data that's more equivalent to that. So we didn't have a history of all the telemetry, which we will have for, the, for our control system. Anyway. So I trained the night operator for detecting the condition and to execute a script that I prepared in order to capture everything that I, we might think is relevant to the condition. And uh, we captured many of those effects. And we had some scientists and engineers analyzing all the data. And after like two months of getting some of these conditions and analyzing it, we discovered that um, when doing the fitting of the surface over the wavefront, um, we were building some planes for, for all the surface fitting. And we expected at least three three of the spots to be uh, defined in each of the places that we need to fit for the surface. But we didn't consider the case where the three spots were perfectly aligned in one line. So there is no claim being possible to define in such condition. The software didn't cover that. So that was exactly the reason why we did a huge residual analysis. And for the test there, we have to capture all the data all the time because it's very expensive and that specific, very detailed work like that. Cool. Interesting. So, uh, next up is uh, Sandrine Thomas, our telescope scientist. Hi, so yes, I'm Sandrine Thomas, um, telescope scientist. I started <coughs> as an optical engineer, really, uh, for telescopes, and that was about in 2001. I started at the SOAR telescope working on the adaptive object, adaptive object system. And um, my integration experience comes from the Japan Planetary Major, which is a very high contrast imaging uh, instrument with a lot of moving parts, with a lot of very dedicated hardware. And one of my anecdotes, I guess, was I was in the lab integrating and pushing the system. And somehow the, the RTC, the real-time computer, used I thought I had the right procedure in mind. I, try, I um, didn't turn off the deformable mirrors. We had two deformable mirrors. 
and it turns out that I did not do the right thing because I was trying to get the uh, software engineer who was away on a trip and didn't, was not in self coverage. And we got my message and we started the system the following day, except that because the deployment mode was on, I killed the connection. And that was a very high, um, that was a very big deal because we had to redo a pupil plane, which costs about six months to delay, and that was a huge, a huge tip. So the lesson learned from that was that having a good procedure written in front of my eye without actually working for six months. So that's what I would say. And the other uh, lesson learned from GPI in general was to have a very good coordination. So morning meetings, emails, or log about who's working on the system when and what the resources that work is done. Um, that's very key as well to make productive meetings in the mornings and to um, make sure that everybody is on the same page. And that was very key. And the last thing, talk about <laughs> Always good advice. Uh, all right, my name is Kevin Real. I work at Slack for the camera team. Um, I wrote down a few notes of things I might share. I think um, first I'd like to give a, a shout out to Alistair Walker, who uh, worked on commissioning with me on Dark Energy Camera. And one of the things that I really learned with that experience was um, Alistair had a pretty good, really, really great plan. And then um, he, he, he expressed in words that um, we should expect it wasn't going to go according to plan. And uh, it didn't. But um, it really helped me go in with the right attitude. Right, I flew down to Chile. I assume sometime in the next three weeks, I'm going to be able to do what I came down here to do, and I don't know when, and that's okay. Um, you know, be patient. And so, uh, if there's one thing I could share is that um, for those of you that are, are assist us in commissioning, um, we really will do our very best to have a good plan put together, and then you should be prepared to be flexible. Um, but I think the two the two things I really wanted to share were from my very very young life. Um, when I was commissioning um, 63 four meter telescopes. And before you think that's really cool, we had cameras that were 256 pixels each. Um, and my first job was commissioning these cameras. They were photomultiplier <coughs> clusters. And I was working in the back of one of these cameras and I, I, I turned around to get something and I bumped it. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw the camera falling off table and I was a brand new dad so I had like cat like reflexes and I grabbed it and you know it's like a hundred thousand dollars so you know it was like more money than I ever imagined in the world at the time um, I was a grad student and there was two things that could have happened next one is that I could have just not told anyone and the other one was to go tell my supervisor what had happened said, you know what, we probably should secure that to the table. <laughs> and so uh, it's not my job, it's not Chuck's job, Chuck Gessner, it's not, it's everyone's job to look for things that will keep people safe and keep, uh, keep our equipment safe. Um, I have another story that involves a four meter mirror and the sun. Um, I'll skip that, if you can imagine. <laughs> bad. Um, but really, commissioning is going to be a, a very, very busy and somewhat somewhat potentially chaotic time, but really we have to take the time to make sure we're working safe, uh, and I think that's that's everyone's job, uh, so please keep that in mind. So before uh, Robert starts, starts um, you said something else too in there that uh, caught my ear, that, you know, um, we all are feeling it. The stress levels in this project are starting to ramp up. It's only going to get more intense as we get into deeper into integration and test and commissioning. And you said a word that really resonated with me, and that's patience. And I think um, that's something, that's a lesson to be learned too, is that as we go into commissioning and we start working, we're going to have to start working together closely as, as a fully integrated team, and it's because some things aren't going to be going exactly the way we want it to go, and we just, we have to be patient with each other, uh, uh, to, you know, to work through some of these problems and, 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 and get them solved, so. I think the thing I enjoyed most of all the commissioning experiences is that uh, keeping a smile on my face as I went even through the challenges, so uh, try, try that. Mr. Love. Okay, thank you. Okay, so 
I'm Robert Upton. Uh, I moved back to Brenton to work on Space Telescope. And we decided that there was a minor commissioning problem on Space Telescope because the mirror was the wrong shape. So we built the Sloan instead. Um, lessons from Sloan, which is now a long time ago, include that we integrated all the different parts of the project together. I wrote a lot of software with the processing, a lot of Jelko, um, but also I wrote the industry control stuff because that's what we needed to do. We were on the mountain every dark round. We had the electronic engineers there, which was Connie, we had a gun, we had me. To get together on the mountain is a very powerful way to find out cross system problems. Um, the next thing you learned from Sloan was that Jim Gunn was probably the best instrument in the world, broke the secondary mirror and he made a mistake. People make mistakes. Even the best people in the world make mistakes. And that's going to happen. You, did, you have to catch your camera, but you know, if you, if you do it twice, then that's a mistake. You're allowed to break things once. <laughs> Robert, do you, do you recall what the mistake was? It was a hard point. Error somewhere and calculating whether you could run into the hard points or not. It was, uh, we did hear that we replaced the supports for the second area. It wasn't a phaser. Yeah, come up to the microphone. Okay, for us. so um, when Russell wanted to go into more detail, we changed supports, we changed the piezos, and that basically ended up getting into the trouble. Jim Gunn wanted more precise positioning of the secondary. He designed some new supports that contained piezos in them. We took them to the observatory. I put them together. I installed them. But I forgot to measure the length to make sure it was the same as the old supports. And they weren't. They were shorter. And so when the mirror got um, homed, it was pulled all the way back. And there was a lot of and a hard. Uh, the mirror center of the mirror touched part of the support system and was pulled hard and the center popped out. Wow. It took a few days for that to happen. But the lesson from that is this was long after commissioning. This was a change partway through the project. In my opinion, the lesson from that is don't let your guard down. Just because you have a working telescope doesn't mean you can't break something later. So if you have upgrades, be careful. Thank you, Russ. And, and um, this also speaks to one of uh, 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 Brian's points for, uh, at, towards the end of his talk, is that details matter. So go ahead, Robert, start. So I think the next thing I commissioned was the ACT telescope, which is 5,100 meters in Chile. And the main problem there was diesel gelling at those temperatures and problem with bandits coming over the border from Bolivia. So very different set of problems than we had on the SDS. <laughs> but they both caused real trouble. <laughs> The next instrument was a screen cam. Here's an image from the left is a dome flat, it's in Y band. On the right is a sky flat. And you will see that the edge of the field, since the net corrected, is brighter than the center of the field. That's totally impossible. Um, it took Gunn and me about five months sorting out what was going on here. And it turns out that the filters are more sensitive at the edge of the field in the middle. I used to go out to Hawaii every month because it was the only way to get communication from the Japanese. And eventually I said, I figured it out. I think the filters have a bigger bandwidth at the edge. And they said, oh, yeah, we have to scan them somewhere. Would you like to see them? <laughs> this, the answer was yes. It also explained the flat field structure we were struggling over in R, but that we weren't seeing ghostly in R. We were seeing, again, we were coupling the filters to nice skylines, all sorts of things. So communication would have been really helpful there. And finally, if you look at those two images I looked at this morning when I made this, pulled up this slide, you'll see there's a feature on the right-hand image, which I've never really paid attention to. Now, that's light coming off the encoders. It turns out that we have some light on our micron. We discovered this later in Spain. In fact, yours just showed these same features again. But now I go back and look at the data we were dealing with while we were fighting much bigger problems. I say, oh, I could have discovered back then that we had problems coming off the encoders and getting into data. But we didn't because we don't catch everything you go know, back and back. Right. Thank you, Robert. Will. So I'm, I'm going to move on. Uh, 
worked in ESA for many years in different areas, uh, from control systems all the way up to the last 12 years, where I've been working on Gaia tree construction into commissioning and operations, uh, and then all the other missions. And I have to say, the only mission that I've seen where there was no problems in commissioning so far was ESA Pathfinder. That was an engineering mission, where the science mission, but in principle, it would be more. Um, this picture, uh, hopefully, is yeah, the, first, the first light image from Gaia. And, you know, if you weren't actually working on Gaia, this looks really horrible. Um, Gaia wasn't spinning, it's meant to spin and breathe out TDI, so this is stationary stairs. And being TDI top level is ECD, so it's actually fantastic in the It's perfectly exactly what we were expecting to see. Um, and uh, things went a bit downhill from there. <laughs> so, you know, Gaia is a space mission, uh, as Brian said, he said, do we, we, we do extensive verification, extensive validation, all the way through from the beginning to the end, um, and you still run into problems. So, Gaia had a bunch of things, uh, you know, most of the problems you know, there's basic angle variations, not as stable as it's supposed to be, the stray light problems, the fibers sticking out at the edge of the sun shield. All of these things you have to discover as you go along the way. Um, and they go down the hill to us people who are in cold science operations, um, or DM in the case here, because what happens is these things they never get fixed. And you're told, you just fix the big software, you can characterize that, you can character it. So I know what's coming to me on the other side. You have a key. I don't know how to get some of the key. <laughs> Probably so. But, um, so again, yeah, mission drives was three months and ended up being about six months, which is still short. Um, and uh, it's really quite a lot of analysis, a lot of scientists sitting in these machines, a lot of people that are moving forward and moving forward and trying to figure out these problems, other problems, water, labor problems, and the ones that I had. Um, LSST will be more difficult, I'm sure. We should pay attention to that. Um, it was a great experience. Um, it's fantastic to be part of the, this enterprise of the report that's in what else is team. I think the planning is definitely needed. I had to go to that one as well, so I've heard that over the year. The planning doesn't work, but if you don't have it, you're even worse off. The other thing I would, I would say is that a written post is going to be well if you have clear channels of communication, so I've heard that coming from forward. We need to establish very clear channels of communication. Also, command and control size, which you do this with both of these. Everybody can remove that. Thanks a lot. And last but not least. Yeah, Rossi. so now I get to add, I disagree with everybody because we're going to be talking now. Um, so my name is Rosie and I'm a uh, data management, I work for Will in Tucson. Um, before I was a desk jockey on a vaporware telescope, um, for many years I worked uh, on a care telescope, so, so I've been part of several instrument commissionings, more than half a dozen, um, two major telescope recommissionings after very heavy engineering and upgrades, uh, and two complete software overhauls. Um, and I will say that commissioning is the best, can be the best of times or the worst of times, um, and it's uh, usually the best of times if you if you get it right. And it is uh, an incredible experience. I'm very excited to uh, see LSST go into commissioning. Um, so I apologize if this point seems a little bit obvious, but even the obvious things um, need to be, are important and, and, and need to work and plan to happen. Um, the one thing I learned in commissioning is that, of course, it's a very exciting time. Everybody has contributed, and everybody wants to be in the freaking control room. Um, we learned very on, early on to be very brutal about this. If you weren't holding a spanner in your hand, you did not get to be in the control room. Otherwise, everybody wants to be there. The software people want to be there. The astronomers want to be there. I'm sorry, but the freaking directors want to be there. Nothing makes your heart sink more than the knock on the door and then the directors walk in and they're going, oh, what's happening? Don't do that. Um, uh, it's understandable. Now, I, I, I agree with Robin that it's important to have people together to talk about problems, but they should not be in the control room. Then they should, they should be somewhere else. Um, and the corollary for that is that you 
everybody who is somewhere else trying to solve problems has to have a very good understanding of what is happening in, in the telescope and the control room. And we've heard some of this before, it's very important to have data and telemetry, micro switches on absolutely everything, uh, machine readable, very accessible uh, logs that have been you know, well narrated that do say things like at midnight I heard a clunking noise so that somebody can go back later and correlate something happening in the data stream with the clunking noise. And my favorite example, because this is, it's people think that and go like a big bloody deal, but my favorite example is we were um, commissioning Scuba 2 on JCMT, which is uh, an extremely sensitive seven millimeter bolometer array. Um, the detectors of Scuba 2 are actually at an operational cold temperature of 70 millikelvin. Millikelvin, it was actually for a while, we believed it was the longest continuously cold place in the universe. It's actually cooler than, than, than empty space. Um, and uh, the cryogenics for the system were incredibly complicated and we anticipated problems and we were geared for problems, but there was this transient noise that would appear and then disappear and it would appear and then it would disappear and we weren't crazy we had checked everything you know we were having people turn off you know their their walkie talkies and their and their phones and you know we would look at the temperatures we would look at the wind speeds we would look at everything we'd think of um, and several months later somebody realized it was when the mechanical engineers were playing music in the dome instrument was so sensitive it was actually getting microphonics from the music um, and so this is this is the kind of uh, thing you you really have to watch out for um, and you can never have too much information too much telemetry too much uh, details the, the other thing I will say is something that um, Will said that struck very close to home which is it is certainly true that there is an expectation that some problems will be fixed in the data processing. Um, and while it is true that this can happen, I really believe that in a complex system like the one that Brian described, um, there is kind of a Vulcan nerve pinch place. There is an optimal place in the system to, to fix a problem. And quite often that is well upstream. I mean, you can have a very modest change from somebody who's driving the header control system or the, uh, the readout for a microswitch that is going to produce a much cleaner, more robust, and more efficient solution than working around uh, that in the code. Um, and I think in a situation where we have lots of uh, distributed teams and everybody's problems seem the most important, it's, it's actually important to also look at the overall health of the system and find the right place to, to fix a problem. Um, and finally, uh, I'll say, be clear of workarounds. Workarounds never die. You know, you, you do something in the middle of commissioning because you try to work around some problem, and like three years later, you go up and cult like the same workaround is being applied, even though that problem has long been fixed. So, uh, even though it's a very busy time, there's lots of things to do. Uh, it's worth taking uh, the time sometimes to, to fix something properly. And I'll stop even though I can right. right. Thanks a lot, uh, Frosty, and all the other panelists. Um, we, ha we have some time now for uh, either questions or uh, other stories from the audience. Um, uh, can ask anything you want about commissioning or, or verification with Ryan up here. But uh, the microphones are open. Um, hello, you've each been involved in numerous past projects uh, at, at stages anywhere from uh, being a grad student to managing it. Uh, in that time, have you seen the projects that you've been involved in learn the lessons that were not learned in the earlier projects that, that you were involved in? As in, uh, do we have hope? <laughs> Robert's shaking his head no. I hope that's only somewhat sarcastic. <laughs> uh, anybody who care to, uh, any of our panels care to feel that a little bit? Will? Yeah, so the well, space agency is quite organized about trying to remember history. Um, I think that's, that's true of NASA, that's true of all space agencies. Uh, 
uh, the problems that you have with something like LSST is you're an organization that's building up to do this. You don't have a history as an organization to remember problems from previous telescopes. The other problem that happens is inevitably each of these projects is super better than the previous one and brings with it its own new set of problems which you couldn't have anticipated. So I think the, the recurring theme across here was you have to expect the unexpected and something's going to go wrong and you have to just do it. Um, but yes, the lessons are learned and I think we, we learned lots of lessons coming into Guy. We want a lot of experienced people in think LSSD is the same. We bring a lot of experienced people together. They bring those lessons. They say, oh, we shouldn't do that. Um, you know, oh, we should do that. Uh, and hopefully some, some of those are listening to and we agree on them. Some of them disagree on them. That's fine. So there is hope. Kevin, you were back with us. Sure, uh, people still drop things. Uh, and people still uh, lose their cool when under stress. And uh, uh, reminding yourself, right, about the complacency that Brian showed. Uh, you can get complacent with how you treat others, and you can get complacent with safety. You can get complacent with uh, following the procedures. And all of those things can lead to bad bad things, so uh, we shouldn't get complacent in any of those. Thanks. So it's interesting. I'm I'm hearing you know in some in in trying to synthesize of what all the panelists have said, um, uh, a key element to successful commissioning is is I would summarize it in is in awareness, right? It's an awareness about what the system is doing. It's an awareness of your fellow uh, uh, partners in this, the people around you. Um, you know that we talk about telemetry. We talk about communication. It's all all a different form of awareness. And that, there's one other kind of awareness that we haven't talked about. And it's be, because I'm a hardware guy. Um, uh, we did this on an on um, an early instrument that I was uh, working on up at Kitt Peak. Is it was we were having uh, filter change problems, and you know it, sometimes the filter would change properly, other times it wouldn't, and we re really weren't getting very far with understanding why and we decided to put a, a microphone up there on the next to the filter changer and you would be amazed at how much you can learn just from what some, a mechanism sounds like when it's going through its um, its motions and operations and and you start to your brain uh, just gets trained to what it's supposed to sound like and then when it doesn't sound that way your brain is very good at picking that up and then you can quickly, you, you now I've identified a moment in time when the sound wasn't right, and then you, now you know where to dig in the, tel in the telemetry to understand it. Um, Robert's about to say something, and then I'll turn it over to, to, to Chuck. Just to weave a microphone up and have a screen cap that you listen to, and once heard the sound of a screw going, which <laughs> you really don't want to hear. So, so, so but the question, question, Robert, is did you find the screw? I think it's somewhere in the filter changer back then. It may <laughs> still be as well. She did find it through. The thing we did find when we took the slow camera for a part was the fan blade that Jim broke off because he couldn't be bothered to break the power out and he was trying to do something down in there. That didn't come out if we took the machine part a year or two later. John. So uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, we're all in this together, and I think uh, communication is something that's really key. The other thing, too, that we've established within our, our project is the work stop authority. And we, there's a number of us in this room that uh, experienced a very uh, devastating occurrence uh, right before deck cam was the project started, right? So the F8 accident. And one of the things that we found when we investigated uh, that particular accident that hurt somebody and damaged the the mirror. We did eventually repair it after several hundred thousand dollars and a year's work of worth of work. Is that the people that were actually doing the job knew something was wrong, but they were afraid to say anything. And so we immediately instilled a work stop authority. And one other lesson that we learned from that 
is that we forgot that glass is sacred. And so whenever we're moving glass at LSST, you can guarantee I will be there because I'm going to instill with the people that work there that glass is sacred. So I just want to say a little bit about both those comments. So it is true, as Chuck said, that we must be patient and, you know, uh, and we must be safe and we must keep all those things in mind. But we actually know a lot about human beings and we know a lot about conditions that make it easier or harder to achieve that, you know, patient and careful and well thought out state. Um, and we know, we know things that are antithetical to that, and one of them is being overwhelmed, being tired, and being stressed. And one of the things that we learn after many commissionings is that, you know, you start off by making this very big commissioning list, and you know, you add up how, it's gonna, how long it's going to take, and it says, you know, for an instrument commissioning, say it's six weeks. So you start off. By, by week two, you tried and you're stressed, and now you have found more problems that you can fix, and you know, this, this list is getting longer, and, and this is how this thing starts. Um, so one of the things that we found, it was, it was actually more productive to have a three-week commissioning period, then shut the freaking telescope down for a month, and then come back for another three-week period, because in the first three weeks, you have found enough things to work on that you really want to deal with before you are, it's actually worthwhile to keep going and then people can get some sleep, they can do their laundry. Um, and so, I would say, less haste, more speed. Beware, beware of these factors, beware of um, just getting into that position where you think you're working very hard because you put in a 100 hour week, but in fact you're becoming less and less effective, more and more stressed, and everybody around you is in the same situation. So just take your time, plan lots of breaks, um, is, is kind of my advice to that. That helps everybody be, be safe and be happy. To my plan. And I, I would like to know, uh, so she said, take breaks and things like that, but I would, I would say make sure you're flexible as well. So we had to do a few um, design changes in the process. We had to do six months for all the actuators, and that was, there was another misalignment in the system. So just be flexible into the planning. Yes, we need to plan, but we also know, we need to know when to change that plan. Yeah, I can do it in the same tone that uh, specifically in software development. Uh, during construction, we are used to our process, uh, implementing requirements, design, testing, releases. We, we, we have time. We think we don't have time, but actually compared to the totally different reasoning during integration and mission, we need to react really fast. The sprints now are for weeks, two weeks. The sprints there are like hours. You need to turn around very quickly some solutions. Sometimes diagnosing, diagnosing you call your system with four people in your back and coming up with something that you have to create and be creative and understand your system, understand the problem that your system is addressing. That's critical. And uh, yeah, we have to react fast. And answers like that's not a requirement is not an answer. We have to create the requirements after something to define that. We have to fix the problem and during daytime, nighttime, it's 24 7. Russell. Well, one thing we found very helpful, and I know you're doing the best you can on it, was to have simulators. So, for example, I had a, I wrote the high level TCS for the Apache Point telescopes. And the person who was doing the low-level stuff gave me a box that pretended to be a low-level controller. And it made all the difference. We got it up in no time instead of uh, spending weeks and months on the mountain trying to get them to talk to each other. So any time you can give somebody a box that does what it's supposed to do and pretends to be running the hardware it's supposed to be running, you come out way ahead when it comes time of commissioning. Get it done now. The other thing I wanted to say is I wanted to say second what Frosty said. Um, Watching people maintain the telescope during our shutdown periods and bringing it up during commissioning, it was like watching sausage being made. And that shouldn't be that way. People picking up light baffles, they're right next to the primary mirror. The primary mirror is facing up. They're holding it in their hand and handing it off the side of the telescope. It, it, Sloan had this philosophy that on-sky time was sacred. 
that any time given to the engineers to mess with the telescope was time taken away from extremely expensive, valuable on sky time. And you can't, it's not, it's not a good idea. Sloan is very productive, it's proud of its productivity, rightfully so. But you have to give the engineers time to do the work carefully and get enough sleep instead of 12 hour days during the shutdown period. So both during commissioning and during engineering shutdowns, I encourage you to back off on the on sky time is money and give people time to do it safely. Thanks, Russell. And uh, I think we have time for Tim, and then we're getting close to the end of our uh, session here. So, Tim, okay. you're I um, just want to follow on from what Francisco said. That, um, you will be changing the software all the time during commissioning. And there is nothing worse than starting the next day, doing the observing, and then realizing that there's some weird problem that was fixed yesterday because a redeployment happened in the morning and your fix didn't go in. And it's in the Git repo, but it's not deployed. And you've got to be very careful with your deployment of software. You don't want to deploy the fix in one location and not the other. It has to be consistently known everywhere what's going on. And you need a way of being able to deploy the thing you fixed last night into the test environments and get everything so into no known state. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing your tail for the first couple of hours of every night. And you don't want to be doing that. Uh, that's what, sorry, that's, that's why I'm going to come to you, Tim, and help. Uh, you're going to help me figure out exactly how we're going to manage that. So uh, I'll be trying to stay off all my software stories because it'll bore half the people, but. You know, not only this is an important point that we always recognize, but I think it's actually, I want to bring on the one thing that, that actually does not come up very often. Yes, we have to do lots of quick rapid security deployments. And yes, we need to know what measure the, uh, what state the system was in, and absolutely signal errors are critical in, in, in ensuring safe deployments. Um, the flip side of that is, it has to be really easy to revert back to a previous version. Um, and that's some, sometimes under, underscored, but, you are uh, very risk tolerant in that situation. In fact, I have found that even astronomers in operations are very risk tolerant. They do want to try the new version because they do want that feature you just put in. Uh, but the flip side of that is, occasionally that will go wrong. You don't have time to do full testing. And so you have to be able to just go back to where you were very easily. And if you do that, it, it actually relieves a lot of pressure and stops you from the kind of vicious circle where you deploy something, it has a bug, and then you try to fix it, and the fix is a bug, and then you're chasing your thing, the bugs, the bugs all the way down. So, version control is a wonderful thing. Thank you, Frosty. I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, I think it's, I, 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 I thought this little experiment worked out. All right, let's uh, thank our panelists here. Um, and Enjoy your coffee break. Uh, for those that uh, came in a little bit late and are unawares, the, uh, our, the commissioning rehearsal that Will, myself, and Keith Bechtel will be running got moved into this room here so we have space. So enjoy your coffee break. Thank you very much. <laughs>